So let's begin tonight's Internet Bible Study. This is Chip Brogdon at the School of Christ.org, welcoming you to the next teaching in the series of teachings from 1 Corinthians. Tonight we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, so I hope you brought your Bible. And if you would please turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we'll get started there in just a few minutes. First, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and let's ask for his blessing on our study. And if you have any prayer concerns or prayer needs, let's join together in agreement for your prayers to be answered and for your needs to be met. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of gathering together in your name, and I thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word. The entrance of your word brings light, and I thank you for the light and the life and the love of God revealed in the face of Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that Christ would be increased, even as we are decreased, that your will and your purpose would be fulfilled in us, and that Christ would have preeminence in all things, beginning with us individually as disciples who are following after Jesus. In the ecclesia, the body of Christ, the synthesis of all those disciples of Jesus who are following him, and ultimately in all creation, that the glory of the Lord would cover the earth as the waters cover the sea, that your great plan and purpose that you purposed in yourself before the foundation of the world would be fulfilled in Christ. I thank you that he is Lord of all, and he is Savior of all. Even though we do not yet see all things submitted to him, I thank you that every knee will bow, of things in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so freely and without reservation, without hesitation, Lord, we submit to the Lordship of Christ here and now. We bow our knee and we confess that he is Lord. And, Lord, we just ask for your strength and for your grace. We thank you for your wisdom and for your Holy Spirit who leads us and guides us into all truth. Open the eyes of our understanding that we would know him and the power of his resurrection. I pray, Lord, that you would meet every need according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus, in whom and through whom we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. And I thank you for every material need being met as we seek first the kingdom of God and your righteousness, that all these things will be added to us as well. So, Lord, we cast all of our care upon you, and I pray for everyone that is joined together and everyone that is listening to me now, that you would bless them, spirit, soul, and body, be made whole, and be sanctified in the mighty name of Jesus. Now, for this word tonight, Lord, I thank you that your word is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, discerning the thoughts and the intents of the heart, making us spiritually mature towards Christ-centered spiritual maturity. So I thank you for your spirit teaching us, leading us, guiding us, as we consider and ponder the truths of your word tonight. We bless you and we glorify you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Wonderful. So if you're in agreement, say amen and type amen into the question box there. That gives me a little sound check as well as it lets me know that we are all in agreement. Wonderful. So thanks for joining us tonight. As I said, we are continuing with the series from 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I want to thank you for your prayers. Last week I was under the weather a bit, and so we had to postpone the webinar for last week. So we're back tonight, and we are progressing forward through 1 Corinthians chapter 5. So thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your support of the School of Christ that makes these free webinars and these free teachings available to people all over the world. As you heard, we are joined tonight by people uh, all over Europe, Asia, South America, North America, so it's a wonderful thing. We appreciate your prayers and your encouragement. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, as we go through a chapter-by-chapter -chapter study of 1 Corinthians, and if you're new to the webinar, the way it works is we go through one chapter a week. I'll give a presentation, and then at the end of the presentation, I'll open it up for any questions or comments that you might have 
concerning the teaching. Uh, so tonight as we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, it's not a very lengthy chapter. It's only 13 verses, but we're going to divide it up and look at it thusly. Number one, response to the sinning brother. We're going to look at how the Corinthians responded to the sinning brother in their midst and try to draw some conclusions and get some lessons on how we should respond to sin in the camp, to sinning brothers or sinning sisters. Secondly, we'll look at the aftermath of Paul's instruction to the Corinthians, how they should have responded to the sinning brother, what he told them to do. And what's interesting is we're going to be able to look and see the effect that his counsel had on the situation. Because when you start talking about discipline and you talk about turning someone over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh, I just have to say again that is not in accordance with what the organized church teaches or how the organized church practices. They do not do a good job. They don't do a very thorough job of dealing with sin in the camp. And we've seen this over and over again with leadership, particularly. Now, they're pretty good at coming down on sin in the congregation. <laughs> but when it comes to sin amongst the leaders, there's a double standard there. So I'm not going to harp on that, but I'm just going to call attention to it so that we can go to the Scriptures and understand how the Scriptures teach to better understand how the early Christians and the early ecclesia and the apostles dealt with sin in the camp, how they dealt with the sinning brother or the sinning sister, and try to draw some conclusions of how we should be dealing with those who are in sin. Because the Word of God hasn't changed, the Lord hasn't changed, but what has changed is our attitude and our approach and our understanding of how these things should be done. But rather than look to man for the example, I would prefer to go to Scripture and let's see how they handled it in Scripture. And then if our religious tradition and our religious sensibilities don't line up with Scripture, then we have to make a decision. Are we going to go with what the Spirit is saying and what the Spirit has taught us through the record of Scripture? Or are we going to follow the example of organized religion? So that's a choice that's totally up to you, but I'm going to set that choice before you tonight as we look in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. So that will be part two, the aftermath. And then number three, the response to the world. So there's two responses here, and there was a bit of confusion amongst the Corinthians, and ironically, the same sort of confusion exists today. There seems to be a tendency that we want to judge people out in the world and forgive people within the fellowship and make excuses for them. So we're very, very good at judging those in the world, very good at judging those who have different beliefs from us, very good at judging those who we consider to be worldly or living in sin, quote-unquote. But when it comes to a Christian brother or sister, or more specifically, when it comes to a leader in organized religion, it may be a pastor, it may be a priest, it may be a prophet or an apostle, it may be an, an evangelist or a revivalist, but it seems in those situations we want to be more understanding and more forgiving and more compassionate and more loving. Well, there's a place for love and forgiveness and compassion. I'm all for it. There's a place for it. But there is also a place for discipline and correction. And so we're going to look at that and study that tonight in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. So we'll start out in 1 Corinthians 5, beginning in verse 1, and let's set the stage for the response to the sinning brother. Verse 1 says, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has 
his father's wife. So what's the situation here? Not most scholars will look at this and will tell you that what Paul is referring to is not someone who has married his mother, but someone who has married his stepmother. So you have a, a man who whose father was married to a woman and then they perhaps divorced or separated or whatever happened, and then he married his father's wife. So this was something that Paul said was sexually immoral. Now, in our very confused age and generation that we live in, we might look at this and not even think that it's all that immoral. The way people are marrying and then they get divorced and then they marry again, and people seem to justify just about any kind of activity under the guise that it's all under the blood and God knows we're not perfect. And, um, you know, God loves me no matter what I do. And so with these kinds of rationalizations, you can rationalize just about anything. Um, I listened to a woman on CNN who was being interviewed, and she makes her living by making porn movies. And she justified her career by saying that she only did it because she was able to spend more time with her young son because she made so much money making porn movies that she only had to work four or five days a month. And so she got to devote the rest of that time to spending time with her young son and was able to provide things for him that she wouldn't have been able to provide for him, for him otherwise. And so you listen to this and you think, well, wow. And she justifies it and says, and says, you know, there's nothing illegal about what I'm doing. I've never been arrested. I pay taxes. This is just how I earn my living. I earn a very good living, and I'm, I've got time to spend with my child, so I'm not hurting anybody. And so what's wrong with it? But then as you keep listening, you come to find out that this young son of hers is 18 years old. <laughs> so the whole argument that I've got to spend time with my son, well, this isn't a little kid anymore. This is an 18-year-old man. So the whole, your, your argument, your justification that it's okay to do this because now I have more time to spend with my young son, well, now your young son isn't a young son anymore. He's a young man and doesn't need you to spend time with him anymore. So. I just illustrate that uh, to, to show you that we, you and I can justify just about any activity that we want. So we might look at this or somebody might look at this and think, well, what's the big deal? He, he married a woman who used to be married to his father. There might be some people that think, well, what's the big deal? There might be some people that, that they've, <laughs> they've married into uh, a situation like this and they don't see it as any big deal. You want to get people emotional. You want to get them upset and angry. You start talking about marriage. Start talking about uh, divorce. Start talking about remarriage. And it gets people emotionally engaged. They get very emotional. But for the, for the most part, people spend a lot of that emotion and a lot of that energy trying to defend whatever lifestyle choice they've made or whatever bad decisions they made in the past, they try to justify it. And they might have been married three times, four times, five times. I know some people that have been married multiple times. Each time God told them to get married, each time God gave them permission to get a divorce, and when you go through this one, two, three, four, five times, you've got to ask yourself what's going on here. So. If we don't recognize that something is sin, it's kind of hard to repent of it and to put it away and to stop doing that behavior. If no one calls it out, if no one acknowledges that there's such a thing as sin, if no one acknowledges that there is sinful behavior or that there are things that are immor that are considered scripture considers immoral, if we can't get agreement on what's right or what's wrong, what's good and what's evil, what's immoral and moral, then it's going to be difficult, isn't it, to judge ourselves or to rightly discern and judge one another. And you say, well, wait a minute, Brother Chip, you're not supposed to judge one another. Well, that's the whole point of 1 Corinthians 5. 
1 Corinthians 5 is going to show us that we are supposed to judge one another. And in fact, by not judging one another, you're perpetuating this vicious cycle of sin and lack of repentance. So verse 2, after he sets the stage and he calls this out, and he says, here's, here's, here's someone living among you that is doing something sexually that is not even done among people who are not Christians. Not even, this kind of sexual immorality is not even occurring among the Gentiles who don't know the Lord. And here you are in this Christian community tolerating this behavior. So verse 2, he says, and you are puffed up. You're proud. What are they puffed up and proud about? Well, maybe they're puffed up and they are proud because they're so liberal, because they're so understanding, because they're so compassionate. We love sinners. <laughs> We're so open. You know, that's the slogan, open hearts, open minds. Whatever you're into, we just love you, where you wherever you are. It may be homosexuality. It may be something else. But whatever you are, whatever your lifestyle choice is, that's fine. We just receive you with open hearts, with open minds, closed mouths. <laughs> right? Well, that, this is what it gets you. you know, so they run commercials on television about how open they are, puffed up, proud. Paul says you're puffed up and have not rather mourned. You should be mourning. You should be grieving. That he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. Wow, Paul sounds very narrow-minded. Paul does not sound very liberal. He doesn't sound very open. He sounds like an old fuddy-duddy. He sounds too conservative. The very idea that someone be taken away from among you because of their sinful behavior. Verse 3, he says, For I indeed as absent in body, but present in spirit, have, have already judged as though I were present him who has so done this deed. Now, wait a minute, Paul, you're not even there. You don't know. Oh, here's my favorite. You don't know the whole situation. You're not there. You don't know the whole situation. You know what Paul would say? I don't need to know the whole situation. I don't have to be there to know the whole situation. I know enough to be able to judge him who has done this deed. Oh, Jesus said, don't judge. No, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, if you're going to judge, judge righteous judgment. So calling sin, sin, is not judging unrighteously, it is judging righteously. The reasons the Pharisees were accused of judging was because they were judging unrighteously. They were judging incorrectly in saying that Jesus was demon-possessed. So their own pride and their own arrogance cause them to judge unrighteously and incorrectly. And Jesus said, judge righteous judgment. So Paul says, I'm not, I'm not there. I'm not present in body, but I'm present in spirit. And I have already judged as though I were present him who has so done this deed. Righteous judgment. Verse 4, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
verse 5, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, have you ever in your life been in a group of people that dealt with sin the way Paul is saying to deal with it? Now, you might, might have heard of things like this, <laughs> but it's an experience that is very rare. I doubt one person in 10,000 even knows what it means to turn somebody over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh and to do it in a way that it is done in love and even understands how you could do it in a way that you would be doing it in love. Because we have been, here, here's why. Here's why it's so difficult for us to judge righteous judgment. To this day, any time I speak about judgment or talk about discernment, I get such a flood of questions in return. Is there a difference between judging and discerning? Well, how do you judge? Is it appropriate to judge? Is it, should you confront? Should you speak out? Should you just pray for that person silently? Uh, what should you do? Is it okay to judge? And the reason why this area is so difficult for people is because we have been indoctrinated by the religious system. Don't, don't say a word. Don't speak up. Keep it to yourself. Don't send the sin of judgment. Submit to the rulers. Submit to the leadership. Let the leadership handle it. It's not for you to deal with. It's not for you to talk about. Don't gossip. And so these years and years of being indoctrinated by the religious system has given us the wrong idea about judgment. And what we discovered if we were part of that system for any length of time, that the reason why they don't want you to speak out and they don't want you to say anything and the reason why to do so would, would open you up to the accusation of sinning the sin of judgment is because they were not prepared to deal with sin in their own leadership, the pastor or the deacon or the elder, or the associate pastor, or the youth pastor, or whoever the person was in the leadership, whenever they got into trouble, whenever they fell into sin, it's a big secret. It's a big cover-up. Don't dare say a word. And so this has created this atmosphere. And then when you come out of that religious system, and it's, it's only with great difficulty that you're able to come out because, again, you're indoctrinated that you're supposed to love, you're supposed to forgive, you're supposed to blindly submit to whatever the Lord's anointed, quote-unquote, tells you. And for you to leave the church, for you to come out of that covering, so-called, would open you up to such spiritual attack that you would be better off just to stay where you are and submit and let God be the judge. God will sort it out. God will keep everybody in line. It's not up to you to judge. It's not up to you to criticize. It's not up to you to say one word or speak one word of disagreement. And that's another reason why it's very difficult, uh, very difficult for people to come out of organized religion. And even when they do come out, it feels like there's some kind of a cord that keeps them attached and they have a hard time. They're straining against it, straining it against it, feeling this force of guilt and shame and this compulsion that maybe they should go back. Maybe they're sitting, who, what makes me think I'm better than them? What makes me think I should judge them? And so they start listening and they start rationalizing. And some of them, not all, but some of them, they end up going right back into the very system that they claim not too many weeks or months or years previous that the Lord had called them out of. The Lord called them out, well, that's what I thought, but now the Lord's called me back in. Oh, really? <laughs> well, what's happened for the most part is we haven't broken through those shackles. We haven't completely thrown off 
those heavy bands and that that weights that weight that has held us back and we've allowed ourselves to be seduced once again by the harlot and that's what the harlot does the harlot seduces the harlot looks real good smells real nice Harlot is very attractive. A harlot is not unattractive. A harlot is attractive. It's trying to attract people. And that's what the harlot church does. It tries to make itself very attractive to people. So it's very attractive and it's very liberal and very open-minded and very progressive to say, oh, we have open hearts. We have open minds. Open doors. We just allow anybody to come in. We accept you and we love you however you are. Of course, you'll never hear a word about sin. You'll never hear anything about here's the way a, a disciple of Jesus is supposed to live. Here's what sexual immorality is. Right? Here's the way you should be living. There's an actual lifestyle of the person who is following Jesus who has made Jesus the Lord and Savior of their life. But organized religion has to compromise in order to get more people into the door, and so this is what happens. And so the Corinthians were puffed up, the way many of our modern, progressive, liberal, loose religious organizations are. They were puffed up as well. So Paul says, here's what you need to do. So let, let's begin. Number one, our response to the sinning brother. We're using the brother as the example. It could be a sister. <laughs> Sisters are just as capable of sinning as brothers are. So number one, first response is you should be mourning. There should be sorrow. It's not an occasion for you to boast about how liberal you are, how open and progressive you are. You should be mourning. And the second thing you need to do, Paul says, is to get this person out of your fellowship. Remove this person from fellowship. Cut them off from fellowship. Now let me tell you why this will not work today. Remove this person from fellowship. You've got, a, you've got a brother who's in sin. He refuses to repent. Paul says remove this person from fellowship. Well, that won't work today. You know why it won't work today? Because if you kick this person out of your fellowship, guess what they're going to do? They're just going to go find another fellowship. Because they'll find another fellowship someplace that will let them in no matter how they are. Now, if you know I'm right, say amen. Why would Paul say, remove this person from fellowship? Well, the point is, when a person is removed from the fellowship of the family of God, because that involvement and the, the family atmosphere of that fellowship is such that it is a very desirable thing to be a part of. You're in a community. You're in the family of God. You're in the ecclesia. You're in, your, in there with your brothers and sisters. It's a wonderful thing there. And so the idea is, if you have someone who is living in sin and refuses to repent, you should cut that person off from fellowship. Why? Because the shame and the pain of not having that desirable fellowship, not being able to interact with the brothers and sisters, not being able to participate in the body of Christ, the shame of that and the great loss that person would have as a result of not being able to partake of the local body of Christ with their brothers and sisters and their relationships would be destroyed, that they would come to their senses and they would repent and they would go with humility back to that fellowship 
and say, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I've asked God to forgive me. I've put away this sin. I ask you to forgive me and receive me back. And once a person had done these things, then the brothers and sisters sisters could welcome them back into the fellowship. Now, the other tradition that they had in the early ecclesia is you could not just go from one fellowship to another unless you had a letter of recommendation. Now, I'm not saying that this was legalistically applied, but it began to be a practice. A letter of introduction or a letter of recommendation that says this is Brother Timothy and he is well known among the ecclesia in Corinth and welcome him as a brother in as a brother in the Lord and receive him as one of Christ's. And then that fellowship in Antioch or wherever he was, he would present this letter and, and then they would they would know who he is in the Lord and they could bring him in and they can have fellowship. And so that would prevent a person <laughs> from despising the discipline of one fellowship, ignoring the body of Christ in Corinth, and say, well, I'll just go to Athens. I'll just fellowship with the body of Christ in Athens. If Corinth won't allow this marriage between me and my stepmother, <laughs> then how could go to Athens and join with that fellowship there? Well, he wouldn't have a letter of recommendation, and so the fellowship in Athens would make inquiry. Well, they would ask, well, where do you come from? How long have you been a Christian? Who else do you know in, in Corinth? And so my point is they would get to the bottom of this person's history, and that person wouldn't just be able to freely go from one fellowship to the other if they were under discipline, if they had been disbarred from fellowship, if they had been cast out because of unrepentance. And that's why I say today this would not work, because today if you were to exclude somebody from your group or exclude somebody from your church or exclude somebody from your fellowship or from your group, why, they would just pick up and go right down the street and get involved with another one and would be welcome with open arms because that's what these groups and these churches, they want. They want all they can get. They're not particular. They, they're not choosy about who they accept. All they want is the numbers. All they want is the tithes. All they want is the bragging rights. So they're not particular. And they'll boast in how liberal they are. Boast in how open they are. They don't even inquire into that person's history or where they came from or where they are in the Lord or what they've been doing or where they've been doing it. No, -uh, they'll just open up the doors. Come on in. So that's yet another reason why we have to remove ourselves from the harlot church. Because if the harlot church will attract and open herself up to anyone, then it's not a place that we want to be in. We don't want to be someplace that is open to everybody, no matter what they believe, no matter what kind of life they live. Because it harms the reputation of the Lord Jesus. And the world looks at this and says, well, what's going on with these Christians? They claim to be followers of Jesus, but they don't live any differently than we live. In fact, they're into doing some things that we've never even thought of before. Now, there's no difference between us and them. So just contrast the attitude of today's harlot church with the instruction 
of Paul the Apostle to the Ecclesia in Corinth on how they should deal with sin in the camp. First you should be mourning, and in, in sorrow and in sadness you should remove the person from fellowship, and you should take an extra step. You should actually deliver this person over to Satan. Do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. And in the power of the Lord Jesus, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. <laughs> wow. That's going even farther than just saying you're not welcome anymore until you repent. You can't be a part of this fellowship until you put away that sin that you're hanging on to. That sexual immorality. And then some people say, well, Brother Chip, you know, we all have sin. We all have things in our life. And if we start kicking out everybody because of sin, there won't be anybody left. So what's your solution to the problem then? Is your solution just to open it up? Throw open the doors and let everybody in. Let all the child molesters in. Let all the drug addicts in. Since we all have sin. Well, that's another false argument. It's a false premise. It's based on the false premise that sin is sin. One sin is just as sinful as another sin. Well, that may be so theologically speaking, but we're not talking about theology. Let me ask you a question. Would you rather have a child molester? babysit your young child or someone who gossips a little too much on the telephone. Now, sin is sin, so the person who's gossiping is in sin as much as the child molester is in sin. But you're going to tell me sin is sin and, no, and sin's the same and it doesn't make any difference, so... Everybody's equal when it comes to sin? Is that the argument? Well, that's a false premise because it should be obvious when you read Scripture that while sin may be sin, from a theological standpoint, all of us have sinned and all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. It's also very true that some sins have greater consequences than others. I'm not talking about eternal consequences. I'm talking about the damage that you do to yourself and to others. So while it's true that we all have sins and different things in our life, nobody is perfect, it's also true that those of us who have these sins in our life, it may be overeating, it may be gossip, it may be struggling with unclean thoughts. Maybe we stretch the truth or bend the truth a little too much. Maybe we're addicted to some drug or to alcohol. But there's a difference between struggling with sin and trying to overcome it and living in sin and making no effort to change your life. And it's that latter case, that latter example that Paul is calling out. So these are the ones, Paul says, this is the one in particular, that you must deliver to Satan for the destruction of their flesh. And why would you do that? Well, that doesn't sound very loving to deliver someone to Satan for the destruction of their flesh. How could you do that and say that you love them? Well, it's very simple, Paul says. We deliver him to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. And what we learn from this very fascinating passage of Scripture is that people who don't repent on their own are turned over to Satan for destruction, not to be destroyed, but to be saved. <laughs> In this wonderful mystery, this wonderful plan of God, God's intention when he turns people over to Satan for destruction 
It's not to destroy them. It's to save them. <laughs> well, if you struggle with that, I don't blame you. It's not an easy thing to wrap your mind around. So you just have to wrap your heart around it. That God is working all things together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. God has a purpose for delivering people over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh. And it's not to punish them. It's not to destroy them. But it's so that their spirit may be saved. There's a purpose in this, Paul says. Sounds so bad. It sounds so terrible. But there's a redemptive purpose in turning people over to Satan for the destruction, not of their spirit, but the destruction of their flesh, to save their spirit, that their spirit may be saved. Now, just how does that happen? Well, that's somewhat of a mystery. But if we look at the aftermath of this episode here, we're going to see the end result. But first, let's read in verse 6. Your glorying is not good. See, Paul was concerned about the sin. He was concerned about the sinning brother. But he knew what to do about that. Get this person out of your fellowship. Turn them over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh, that their spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. But what he was really upset or concerned or disturbed about was the fact that the Corinthians, instead of being sorry for what was going on, they were glorying in it. They were puffed up, he says. They were proud. Verse 6, he says, your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So he gives them an example there. If you let just a little bit of leaven into the lump, it leavens the whole lump. You, if you let this sin go without bringing discipline and correction and judgment, then particularly the younger brothers and sisters are going to look at this behavior and say, well, no one disciplines or corrects him for his behavior. That must be an endorsement. It must be okay. If it's okay for him to live that way, it must be okay for me to live that way. And this is why when in Galatians chapter 2, when Paul says that Peter came to Antioch, and he saw that, that Peter had sinned in showing favoritism, that's why Paul says, I, I said to Peter in front of them all. Why? Because Peter's a leader. You can't do that. If people see you behaving this way, showing partiality and prejudice, they're going to look at your behavior and they're going to assume, as the elder brother in Christ, that it's okay for them to be that way. And if it's not okay for them to be that way, then there has to be a very public confrontation so that everyone will see this is not acceptable this is unacceptable and that's why the sinning brother or the sinning sister has to be dealt with in this manner and if you don't deal with it then you're doing the opposite silence is consent So somebody will say, oh, Brother Chip, if you were to do that, if you were to take Paul's advice and if you were to do that today, why, it would just be a terrible thing. People would just be discouraged and they would be, they would probably 
stop following the Lord and you would discourage them so bad they would go back out into the world. You have to love people. You have to accept them as they are. And you just have to embrace them. And Well, let's look at the aftermath of Paul's counsel. And to do this, keep your finger in 1 Corinthians 5. We're going to skip ahead to 2 Corinthians chapter 2 to see the follow-up letter that Paul wrote to them where he specifically addresses the aftermath of this episode. Now, in going back and, and referring to his first letter that he wrote to them, he says he wrote to them as a test to see if they would do the right thing, as he had told them, that this is what you need to do. And so concerning this, what we understand is that they did. That's another miracle. Most people today wouldn't pay any attention to Paul. If they told them to, if he told them how they should deal with this situation, they would probably ignore it. To their credit, the Corinthians did exactly what he told them to do. They cast this person out of their fellowship. They turn him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. And look at what happened. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6 says, This punishment, which was inflicted by the majority, is sufficient for such a man, so that, on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Therefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. For to this end, I also wrote that I might put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things. Now, whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Well, here is the aftermath of doing it the way Paul said to do it, excluding this person from fellowship, turn them over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh. Now, if there is any sense or any trace of the life of God in this person, this person is going to be quickened. They're going to see the error of their ways. They're going to wake up. And so now, once that has happened, Paul says this punishment was sufficient. Now comes the forgiveness and comfort. And see, this is where our modern-day harlot church gets it all backwards. We want to forgive and comfort people who haven't even repented. They've not even stopped sinning, and we want to give them forgiveness and comfort. See, you've got to get the order correct. You can't forgive and comfort someone until you have first disciplined them and they have expressed remorse, godly sorrow, and repentance. And repentance means they've stopped doing the thing. <laughs> they've stopped doing it. They're not still doing it. There was a, a pastor many years ago you know, he was the one preaching against sexual sin and preaching against it and preaching against it. And lo and behold, he got caught with a prostitute. Oh, so he cried at crocodile tears and he repented and confessed his sin. And not long after that, he got caught again. Well, you haven't repented, buddy. You haven't repented. Of course, he's still pastoring today, <laughs> you know. So has he really repented, or has he just not gotten caught the third time? But when we are so quick to forgive and so quick to comfort and so quick just to, to brush everything under the carpet, and we don't take the proper steps of discipline, exclusion from fellowship, and if it's someone who's used to standing behind the pulpit, it means you don't stand behind the pulpit. You don't go off for a, a month and a half or two months to a little spiritual retreat someplace and then come back and all of a sudden you're back in church again. You've disqualified yourself. Now, 
but now it's just, you know, you, you take a leave of absence is what it amounts to. Take a little vacation someplace, come back and say you've repented, you've turned over a new leaf, and, and you're right back where you left off. There's no discipline, there's no exclusion, there's no turning over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh. We just want, we're, so, we're too quick to forgive a, a lot of times. I'm sorry to have to say it, but that's just the truth. We're too quick to forgive and forget. Too quick to forgive. Too quick to forgive. Too quick to forgive before we have first disciplined. Because if there's no discipline, there's not going to be any godly sorrow. If there's no godly sorrow, there's not going to be any repentance. If there's no repentance, then the behavior is just going to keep perpetuating itself. They'll keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. They'll just get better and better at hiding it. So that doesn't help them to forgive them too soon and comfort them too early. It doesn't help you. It just makes you feel better, makes you feel like you've done your Christian duty, makes you feel spiritual, makes you puffed up that you're so magnanimous and so large-hearted that you can forgive and forget. Well, nobody's perfect, brother. I, I know that. I'm not saying that we are. In fact, <laughs> I've already said that's not God's goal for us to, to, have, to live in sinless perfection. He expects us to live and strive towards spiritual maturity, not spiritual perfection. But that's not giving people an endorsement because you can't be perfect. There's no need to live a holy life. There's no need to, to be sanctified. There's, it's okay to go out and commit all kinds of sexual immorality. We're not saying that at all. So if we, if we follow the steps that Paul outlined, first we have to bring the discipline. And then once the punishment is sufficient, Paul says, that, hey, this guy's repented. He stopped sinning. He got rid of that woman. Punishment was sufficient. Now is when you can bring in the forgiveness and comfort and reaffirm your love. Reaffirm your love. Because when you're being disciplined, it doesn't always feel like love. It feels like punishment. So discipline is tough. It's supposed to be tough. It's supposed to be uncomfortable. So there's going to be a question, because it's so uncomfortable, there's going to be a question. Well, do these people really love me to talk to me this way, to treat me like this, to keep me, kick me out of my fellowship? <laughs> That's why you would have to go back and reaffirm your love after the repentance, after the conduct has changed. But if the discipline is not severe enough, love is not questioned, then there, there's nothing to reaffirm. They don't doubt it because the discipline isn't strong enough. And therefore, it's not effective enough to get this person to open their eyes and to change their ways. So this is how tough love is illustrated. But again, to go back to, to the main point, if you extend forgiveness and comfort too soon in the process, then the process can't bring itself to the conclusion that it needs to, which is the person stops sinning. That's the outcome that we want. We don't care about hurting their feelings. We don't care about making them mad. We don't care about making their friends mad. We don't care about being accused of being judgmental. All we care about is that the person stops living in sin. And so whatever it takes, cut them off from fellowship, turn them over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh, because their spirit is, is the most important thing here. But now that they've repented, now that they have acknowledged their sin, and again, you can't repent until you can acknowledge that what you're doing is sinful. If you think it's okay to get married and divorced and remarried five times, 
and you don't acknowledge that there's a problem there, you, you can't be healed of that. You can't be forgiven of that. And what I'm saying is that people, particularly when it comes to sin in their own life, they are too quick oftentimes to lay hold of the forgiveness and the grace and the comfort and the love of God and skip right past the discipline of the Holy Spirit, skip past the chastening of the Lord, and convince themselves that because they prayed a prayer, God has forgiven them and all is forgotten. But they've never gone through any chastening. They've never gone through any discipline. They've never even acknowledged that the thing that they did is, in fact, sin. Instead, they'll just wave their hands and say, my God is a God of second chances, and he's given me a second chance, and a third chance, and a fourth chance, and a fifth chance, and a sixth chance. They haven't repented. They still they are doing the same thing over and over again. Now, if that's you, repent of that. Stop doing that. Call it for what it is. It's sin. Repent of that. Ask God to create in you a clean heart and renew a right spirit within you so that you don't keep stumbling in the same area over and over and over again. And you've got to submit to some discipline. You've got to submit to some chastening of the Lord. And she says that chastening is not pleasant. It's not fun. It's not an enjoyable experience. But if we're too quick to grasp hold of the joy of grace and forgiveness and we don't experience the pain of discipline and chastening, then we will always go back and we'll just keep repeating the same sins over and over again in an endless loop, an infinite loop, going through the same disappointments, same frustrations. The final thing he says with this particular brother, now that he has repented, you can forgive and comfort him, reaffirm your love. And the reason we should reach out to that person now and receive them back into fellowship is so that Satan will not get any advantage over us. And what's the advantage? Well, the advantage is that he would cut this person off completely so that this person no longer feels that they're even worthy to be part of the family of God. And so then Satan will have accomplished through the ecclesia what he was unable to to accomplish through the sin. So once the sin has been dealt with, now we can forgive, and now we can reach out, now we can reaffirm their love, now we can reestablish that relationship, now we can bring that person back into fellowship. You say, well, Brother Chip, what if they don't repent? Well, then you don't bring them back into fellowship. You don't call them up every week and say, have you repented? Have you repented? Have you repented yet? Have you repented yet? Call them up the next week. Have you repented yet? (laughs) No. If they've repented and they want to be restored back into a relationship with you, then they'll they will seek you out. But I guess my takeaway from from this example, and even though it's two thousand years old, it's still very appropriate to the times that we live in, because people have not changed all that much. But what I take away from it is we can't let fleshly, carnal people monopolize and dictate the expression of Christ in the fellowship of the saints. We can't can't let fellowship with one another be monopolized by these carnal Christians, fleshly believers. But in in many groups, that's exactly what happens. The one who is most carnal, the one who is most fleshly, 
the one who is most immature, the one who is most outspoken, they're the ones that dominate the group. They're the ones that dominate the discussion. They dominate the prayer time. They dominate everything. And this is why we have to deal with these issues and treat them as leaven coming in to contaminate the entire lump. And there is a time and a place for forgiveness and comfort, affirming your love, absolutely. After the discipline has been given and the repentance has been confirmed. So that takes some humility, doesn't it? It takes some humility on the part of the person sinning. It takes some humility on the part of the people doing the discipline. It takes spiritual maturity for us to apply these principles faithfully. And so that's why they don't get applied. Because it's easier just to let things go and not say anything helps us to save face. All right. So then we return back to 1 Corinthians 5, and now Paul is going to give them a little word of correction to something that he had told them earlier. And it's going to be a word of correction for us as well. So in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 9, He says, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Well, that sounds pretty straightforward. Don't keep company with sexually immoral people. That makes sense. Stay away from sin. Those sinners, stay away from them. Verse 10, and now he's going to bring them the the word of correction. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. Huh? He's saying, I told you not to keep company with with people like that, but I didn't mean... to try and stay away from the people of this world. I didn't mean to sequester yourselves into your own little fellowship and try to shut the world out and keep all the bad people on the outside. That's not what I was talking about. So here's, let me be specific, verse 11. He says, but now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother. Don't keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or, is that reviler or reveler? I don't know. Or a drunkard. It's someone who stirs up trouble. I know that. Or an extortioner. He says, do not even eat with such a person. Now, who is, it, who is this he's talking about? People who call themselves brothers and sisters, and yet they live sexually immoral lives, covetous, idolaters, drunkards. He says, don't have anything to do. Don't, don't keep company with them. Do not even eat with such a person. Now, do you see how the harlot church has turned this all upside down? The harlot church builds the four walls and tries to get Christians huddled together into those four walls as a refuge and a safety net and a safe haven from all those evil, bad, sinner people out in the world. But Paul says, I don't expect you not to have any company with people out in the world. How are they going to see the light of the Lord Jesus and be saved? How are they going to see your example and your witness if you're not out in the world where they can see you and interact with you and talk with you? The light that is in you should be greater than any darkness that is out in the world. 
so Paul says, I'm, I'm not talking about separate yourself from sinners out in the world. I'm talking about if you have a brother or a sister who claims to be a brother and a sister, and yet they're living a life that contradicts what it means to be a brother and a sister in Christ, don't have fellowship with them. Cut yourself off from them. Do not even eat with such a person. Here's yet another reason why God calls us to come out of the harlot church. You're better off out in the world than to be in the midst of the harlot church, people going through the motions of vain worship. In vain they do worship me, Jesus says. In vain they do worship me, preaching for commandments, the doctrines and teachings of men, as if they were the commandments of God. These people honor me with their lips. They draw near to me with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. This is what Jesus has to say about the religious institution of his day. It's no different than the religious institutions of our day. So Paul says, look, don't get don't hang around hypocrites. Don't be a part of hypocritical false fellowship. Cut off fellowship. Don't eat with people who claim to be brothers and sisters in Christ and yet they live the way they live it differently than someone out in the world. They're hypocrites. Verse 12, he says, For what have I to do with judging those also who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? And if you were to ask today's church, they think they're supposed to judge those on the outside. All the people who listen to country music and all the people who run around on Saturday night and all the people who get drunk and all the people who don't go to church like they do. Sit in judgment of them. Meanwhile, it's just love and forgiveness and mercy for their own selves every time they get caught in something that they shouldn't be a part of. Well, of course, that's exactly opposite from what Paul says. What have I to do with judging those who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? Verse 13, but those who are outside God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves the evil person. See, that's where the problem is. That's where the leaven's coming from. The leaven isn't coming from the world. You don't have anything to be afraid of from the world. Greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. God so loved the world. Go into all the world. Do you see this? But organized religion builds a fortress against the world and tries to get us to come inside and huddle together for warmth and safety and security. To hell with the rest of the world as long as I'm on the way to heaven. Hallelujah. That's the attitude. Let the rest of the world go to hell. They won't come to church. That's where they're going anyway. Well, Paul says, it's not up to me to judge people that are outside. God will judge those who are outside. It's up to me to judge those that are on the inside. So if you have any questions about judging, there's your answer, my friend. We are to judge and discern one another, not the people out in the world. But God's controversy is and has always been with those who would call out to him, Lord, Lord, in your name we did thus and so. And he says, I don't know who you are. I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. God's controversy has always been with the hypocrite. God's controversy has always been with the one who had the outward appearance of righteousness, but inwardly 
had the character of a wolf dressed up in sheep's clothing set to steal, kill, and devour. That has always been God's controversy. Jesus was accused of being too friendly with sinners. (laughs) Too friendly. Oh, here's a man who eats and drinks with sinners. Meanwhile, he pronounced woe and judgment on those religious leaders who had such a good appearance on the outside, but Jesus said, God sees your heart. And woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. How will you escape the damnation of hell? It is, in fact, the spirit of the hypocrite to turn all the attention, all the judgment outside on the world, on those sinners who don't go to church, all those bad people, and never deal with their own sin. Never deal with the log in their own eye because they're looking for the specks in everyone else's eye. So Paul's counsel is pretty straightforward. Our response to the world is this. He says, number one, have no fellowship with sinners. But he says, listen, I don't mean don't have fellowship with the sinners of this world. If that was the case, you'd have to get out of the world, which is what many are trying to do. And yet God has us in the world as ambassadors for Christ. So what's he talking about? He says, I'm talking about don't have fellowship with hypocrites. Brothers and sisters who keep living in sin, pretending to be something that they're not. And he says that we judge those who are on the inside. God judges those who are on the outside. Isn't that interesting? So three takeaways, and then I'll open it up for your questions and comments if you have any. Takeaway number one. If members in the early ecclesia, are held to this standard. How much more the leaders who sin? Now, we've been just been talking about just just a brother, just someone who's who's a brother living in sexual immorality. This is what Paul says needs to be done with him. Now, if if the ordinary brothers and, and sisters and members are held to this high standard, how much more the leaders who sin? Paul says, deliver this brother over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. Well, what do you think should should be done with leaders who make the same? Should they be held to a different standard? Or should we hold them at least to the same standard as anyone else? Takeaway number two. Affirming love, this is important, because I'm all for love and forgiveness and the grace and mercy of God. I thank him for his grace and mercy and love and forgiveness every day. I thank him that he's made us and he's made me a king and a priest in a kingdom that's based on love and mercy and grace and forgiveness. At the same time, we have to make this, this observation that affirming love without discipline does not lead to godly sorrow and therefore it doesn't lead to repentance. Affirm the love, affirm the love, affirm the grace and mercy of God, but don't call on people to repent and you're going to have a mess. And that's exactly what we have. You know, when Jesus began to go out and preach, he didn't go out and, and preach and say, God loves you. He went out and preached and says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That, that was, That was how he began his preaching. He didn't begin his preaching by saying, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. He started out saying, repent. Now, the reason you should repent is because God loves you and wants to have a relationship, wants to have fellowship with you. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. But you can't get there without there being repentance. 
Leave your life of sin. 2 Corinthians 7.10, Paul reminds them that godly sorrow produces repentance, which leads to salvation. And if all you do is affirm the love of God, affirm the forgiveness of God, but you, you never bring people to a place of godly sorrow or repentance for their sins. They don't even know what sin is. They don't even acknowledge that they've done anything wrong. It's going to be really hard for them, impossible, for them to repent. To repent means to change your mind, to change your heart, to change your behavior. It's a change of heart that causes a change of mind that leads to a change of behavior. It's the essence of what it means to be born again. It means my old life is gone. I've started a new life. And it doesn't matter what your old life was. God's mercy and his grace is big enough to give you a fresh start so that you can begin all over again. But there has to be repentance. <laughs> you can't take the grace of God for granted. You can't go out and sin a thousand times a day. You just say, well, God, forgive me. It's all under the blood. You're making, then you're making a mockery of the grace of God, and you're tempting the Lord. So don't do that. Take the time to repent. Take the time to acknowledge your sin so that God can give you a new heart and a new beginning and a fresh start. And finally, takeaway number three, there's no need to shut out the world. There's no need to shut out the world. If you are afraid of the world, if you are afraid that something out in the world is going to lead you down the wrong way, then you don't know who you are in Christ. You need to understand that you are in the world as a light to the world, as an ambassador for Christ, and that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So you can be an example to the world. You don't have to shut the world out and be afraid of the world. What you need to shut out is these false brothers and sisters, these hypocrites. Paul says, I don't have anything to do with judging those outside of Christ, but those within the body of Christ, those who claim to be brothers and sisters when they're living in sin, those are the ones that we have to judge. We judge them. We discipline them in love in hopes that they will repent so that we can reaffirm our love and we can restore them back to fellowship. So it's very difficult to try and take the, this scripture and apply it to our life and our walk today. It's difficult because we don't know the scriptures and we don't know the power of God and we don't trust that if we will follow the leading of the Spirit and if we will be obedient to the Word of God, then we can give the Lord an opportunity to turn something around to bring life, to bring light, to bring love out of a situation. But it has to be his way. It can't be our way. Compromise does not lead to spiritual growth and maturity. In fact, just the opposite. It leads to carnality. And it leads to a fleshly fellowship. And that's why Paul had to address this so strongly and so firmly in his letter to the Corinthians.